Introduction by James Al Tucker Money is not everything. Everyone knows this. The fastest way I've ever lost track of my goals and passions was when I focused on the money. But we do know that money is nice to have. It helps us support our families. It helps us feel relief in many situations. But before you can make money you have to help others make money. I've been very fortunate with my podcast. I've had the opportunity to talk to many entrepreneurs, artists, billionaires, athletes, and other people from all corners of success. In this particular book I've put together the interviews I've had with five different billionaires. They all came from wildly different backgrounds. They've all had very varied careers. But they also had many things in common. They all had crazy ideas. The important thing to remember is that an idea always seems totally insane right up until the day before it works. Then it becomes clear it was a good idea. They all leveraged small successes into greater successes. It's very rare that a person just ends up with a billion dollars in his lap. Mark Cuban is a great example of this. He went from selling a bar to selling a software company to running a hedge fund to starting broadcast.com to have Yahoo shares his first billion to owning the Dallas Mavericks many billions Peter Thiel is another example he went from being a top lawyer to running a small hedge fund to starting PayPal he made 55 million dollars there when they finally sold to eBay for 1.5 million dollars to funding Facebook he made about a billion there to co-founding Palantir, many billions. Learning to leverage small successes into bigger ones is the key to abundance. They all recognize the importance of being healthy in other areas of their lives. As an extreme, you can't have great ideas if you are sick in bed all the time. They are all believers in ready, fire, aim, or, as Richard Branson puts it, screw it, let's do it. They believe in big visions. Ted Leonsis believed everyone would have a computer in their home that would be online. Peter Thiel believed that everyone should pay for things online. And so on. They are all believes in modeling the success of people who have come before them. Tony Robbins described what I call his Tony Robbins method. Without every teaching sharpshooting before he was hired to teach a group of Marines to be successful sharpshooters. I'll let him tell the story in the later chapter of what happened next. By the way, is Tony Robbins a billionaire? Who knows? I do know that he is at least worth several hundred million so I'm not going to try and guess how many hundreds of millions. I also know that he is a mentor and guide to many billionaires. So he's included in this book because he has many valuable lessons to teach. Failure versus hard problems. I'm sure many of these people have had failures in their lives. But one thing I noticed consistent among them and others that I've spoken to is that they don't view failures as stopping points, they view them as opportunities to solve hard problems. When you get good at solving hard problems, you get better and better at dealing with the obstacles that arise in every business opportunity. These guys are the masters and the ones that I want to model my own business efforts after. I'm including an extra chapter in this introduction. I haven't interviewed Richard Branson but I've gone over everything he's written and pulled out my favorite quotes. The rest of this introduction is 10 things I've learned from Richard Branson. And then I turn it over to the billionaires. 10 Things I Learn from Richard Branson Richard Branson is the perfect example of ready, fire, aim. He starts something. He does it. Then he looks to see if he hit the target. If not, he starts something new. I love the story of how he started Virgin Airlines. He was already successful from Virgin Music. Note that now he has nothing to do with Virgin Music. I don't even know if Virgin Music still exists. All that is left is Virgin Air. 
a plane had gotten cancelled. Everyone was upset. But Branson wasn't upset. He found a plane that would take him. But he didn't. Have the money. One good thing to start with always is to imagine the obstacles gone. Imagine. If I wasn't worried about money, would I still make this trip? I call this idea subtraction. Subtract the perceived obstacles to an idea and... Bam, you find that many more ideas are born from that. First, he arranged to rent the private plane, even though he still had the... Obstacle, no money. Then he put up a sign, $29 for a plane to Puerto Rico. And everyone signed. Up. Suddenly he had the money for the plane. That was his proof of concept for an airline. Now that is his main business and it's worth billions. Here are 10 quotes from him that I think are valuable. A. Richard Branson, listen more than you talk. Nobody learned anything by hearing themselves speak. B. Richard Branson, start making suggestions for how to improve your workplace. Don't be a shrinking violet, quietly getting your job done. Adequately. Be bold, and the sky is the limit. Note he's not suggesting start a company. You can always create inside any surrounding and you will be infinitely rewarded for that. The first employee at Google is now a multi-billionaire even though nobody knows his name, Craig Silverstein. He was an employee and he created and blossomed. C. Richard Branson, age isn't as important so long as you are surrounded by people you love, doing things you passionately believe in. I truly believe this. We all have things we love to do. And it's the people around us who love us that help us unlock these dreams. It's only when you find the people you love, you can create and flourish. Henry Ford was 45 when he started his third car company and created the assembly line. He did this once he eliminated all the people who tried to control him at prior companies. Colonel Sanders was 65 when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. Lauren Galls Wilder was 65 when she wrote her first book. The book that would turn into the TV series, Little House on the Prairie. This was after she had been totally wiped out in the Great Depression and left. With nothing but she started to surround herself with people who encouraged her and pushed her to pursue writing to make ends meet. D. Richard Branson, what I personally know would make up a dot so minuscule it couldn't be seen. What humanity has collectively learned so far would make up a tiny mark within the circle. Everything we all have to learn in the future would take up the rest of the space. It is a big universe, and we are all learning more about it every day. If you aren't listening, you are missing out. The other day someone asked me if I believed in God. There's no answer. Always have relevance for the infinite things we will never know. Our brains are too small. This next quote I slightly want to change. E. Richard Branson to be a real entrepreneur you always have to be looking forward. The moment you rest on your laurels is the moment your competition overtakes you. I think entrepreneur can be changed to human. We all have to survive and succeed first as humans. And the job description changes every day. Every day there is room to finish the sculpture that began the moment our mothers released us into the world. F. Richard Branson, there is no such thing as a boring person, everyone has stories and insights worth sharing. While on the road, we let our phones or laptops take up our attention. By doing that, we might miss out on the chance to learn and absorb ideas and inspiration from an unexpected source, our fellow travelers. Every day has stories hidden inside of them, like a treasure hunt. When you find those stories, you get rewarded. Not by money, but by dot 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 I don't know. Something. You feel it when it happens. Gee, Richard Branson, it can be easy to find reasons not to do something. However you might be surprised by how much help is at hand if you put yourself out there and commit to a project.
it doesn't have to be a case of struggling along by yourself. We live in a world of connection. The barriers we've erected by storytelling, religion, nationalism, corporatism, are breaking down. You can crowdsource a revolution with a single tweet now. There are a million ways to ask for help and a million people who want to help you. But it's hard to ask. There's the old fears of rejection. Fears of people viewing. Asking as weakness. Fears of infringing on someone by asking. Offer value in. Your ask and then the reasons to not do something start to go away until there. Are none left. And again, Branson is referring to idea subtraction which has constantly. Propelled him from success to success. H. Richard Branson. When most people think about taking a risk they associate it with negative connotations, when really they should view it as a positive opportunity. Believe in yourself and back yourself to come out on top. Whether that means studying a course to enable a change of direction, taking up an entry-level position on a career ladder you want to be a part of, or starting your own business, you'll never know if you don't give it a try. Another example of how Branson would use idea subtraction to come up with tons of ideas. For instance, sometimes people say, if only I knew how to program I could do X. Well, imagine you could program. Subtract that worry. Now what ideas would you implement? You can always subtract a worry, whether it's putting up a sign, $29 to get to Puerto Rico, or as Branson suggests above, taking an entry-level position. When I started my first successful company my job title was, Junior Programmer. Analyst at HBO and I had zero dollars in the bank. I took an entry-level job so I could move to NYC and start making connections. I stayed at that job for three years while building my network. For more than half of those three years I had my first company on the side building up. I was afraid all the time I would get caught doing two jobs at the same time. But I did learn that these almost insurmountable obstacles were the exact reason I had huge opportunities. When people think a problem is impossible they value it at zero. Successful. People buy ideas low, zero, and sell them high. You ask why can't I? As in the following quote from Branson, Richard Branson, I've always had a soft spot for dreamers, not those who waste their time thinking what if but the ones who look to the sky and say why can't I shoot for the moon? Does he really mean the moon here? Or does that sound cliché? Let's look. When Branson was a teenager and started his first magazine devoted to music, I doubt he was thinking about shooting for the moon. But who knows? Now his Biggest investment is Virgin Galactic. That magazine, which he started despite severe dyslexia, literally turned into a company that is now shooting to land a ship on the moon. Why not? Why not? J. Richard Branson, together we can make the products, services, businesses, ideas, and politics for a better future. In this new power world, we are all makers. Let's get making. Sometimes people write to me not everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur. Some people like being employees. I agree with this. There is nothing wrong with being an employee. It's what you make of it. I've been an employee many times. The key is to realize that an employee doesn't mean you give up on creating, on making, on coming up with ideas. In fact, an employee often has more opportunity for abundance than an entrepreneur. The playing field is much larger in the big corporation where everything is possible. I went to graduate school with Astro Teller, who was recently on my podcast. He runs the special projects division at Google called Google X. He's an employee at Google. He was asked to dream at Google and now Google, a software company is making driverless cars it seems insurmountable what if we can make a car 
without the driver? But that's where the opportunity is. Every day I wake up and it's a constant battle in my brain against obstacles. Usually not business obstacles but emotional ones. Fears. People. Ideas. Hopes. This is life. A stream of obstacles and fears in a tough world. I wish I had paid attention to the many wonderful virtual mentors, the Richard. Branson's of the world, when I was younger. But now I can. And I hope you can. Also. Think like a billionaire. Tony Robbins. James Al Tucker, I'm James Al Tucker here with Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins, nice to meet you officially. James Al Tucker, you know, I just first wanted to say thank you. Actually, because in 2001 to 2002, I had millions of dollars, sold a business, totally went broke, lost my house, lost everything, and I would read your two books over and over again, and I had my business partner read them, and we both really got off the ground. There's that sensation where you have to peel yourself off the ground somehow, but you need something to do it cause you don't know how to it. It's all your best thinking got you on the ground. So Tony Robbins, that's true. James Al Tucker, and, you know, and I've totally plagiarized. Your no complaints diet. So that really helped me. No complaining for 10 days. I think I remember it. From one of the books. Tony Robbins, yeah, that's right. Well, you should share some of that, at least a few seconds of that on the line so they know that there's an affinity for what you've read before. James Al Tucker, and you're the author of this new book. Brand new book, Money, Master the Game, 7 Simple Steps to Financial Freedom. I've been privileged to have an advanced copy and read it. I'm incredibly impressed. It's been, what has it been, 20 years, over 20 years since you've had a book out. Tony Robbins, over 20, yeah. James Al Tucker, and, you know, I think we both have the sense of why, just because the economy has turned upside down. Everyone's afraid. But maybe in your words, why now? Why did you write this book? Tony Robbins, first of all, I hadn't written a book for two decades. Cause I'm on a plane about every four days. I have 12 companies that I run directly and 12 that I indirectly run. I've been in 15 countries, on average, each year, and I love what I do. I get to talk to 6,000 to 10,000 people at a time and it's live and it's raw and it's real, and books for me, you know. Most people don't read, and then secondly, for me, to sit still for that long a period of time, it's kind of a pain. But I wrote this now, to answer your question. Because when I saw 2008 happen, I grew up in a very tough environment, emotionally and financially, and I tied those two together. They don't always go together, but I did tie them together in my head. And so when I saw people suffering, at a level that was just crazy. Families losing half of all they had, people couldn't send their kids to college anymore, people couldn't retire, it just made me sick. I thought the system's gotta change. Two years later, as you and I both know, the system's not changed. Lots of promises but not with any real core change. And I saw this documentary called Inside Job, which actually won the Academy Award eventually. Matt Damon did the voiceover for it. And it is probably one of the best documentaries to walk through what actually happened and how a small number of people almost blew up the entire world economy. But the crazy thing is the punishment for that, most of us caught a sense of today, is we bailed them out, but we didn't just bail them out. We put them in charge of the recovery. It's just mind-boggling what's happening, so I think if you watch that film, 
you're either really depressed, or you're really angry, and I left angry, and I thought what could I do? And I thought, well, I have access. Most people don't know. It's a good thing I'm Mr. Motivator or something of that nature, but for 21 years, I've coached Paul Tudor Jones, who's one of the top 10 financial traders in the history of the world. James Al Tucker, let me ask you about that. So he calls you up. Out of the blue, like, were you sitting in a chair and somebody said, oh, Paul Tudor Jones is on the phone. How did that happen? Tony Robbins, no, Pat Riley actually called me and said there's a friend of mine. Pat had left the Lakers and gone to New York and was the coach at New York at the time, and Pat and I are good friends. I've helped him with sports teams throughout the years. And he said, there's a guy that desperately needs your help right now. He's going through a tough time. He's one of the best in history, and he's having a real challenging time. And I said, who's Thank that? Thank you for watching. He said, don't forget Paul to Tudor subscribe Jones. and like. I said, wow. I said, you know, I'd love to meet him. He said, well, he'd love to meet you. So we met at a Knicks game and then I went out to visit with Paul and spend some time and I've been working with Paul since he was 39 years old and he just turned 60. So that gives you a sense of the length of time. And I have learned so much from Paul it's scary. Because I've been with Paul through the 2000 stock market crash. I was there, you know, with him. Seeing what he did in 9-11. What does he do when we have a crisis? He's made money every single year for 21 straight years. His fund has made money 28 years in a row. To give you an idea. But I've been there side by side with him when gold drops, you know, the largest drop we've had in recent history, and I've seen what he's done. So I have these insights, and I thought, because of him, I've got access. You know, I've been doing this for a couple decades, and I'm gonna go to 50 of the smartest people in the world financially and self-made billionaires, people who literally started with nothing, guys like Ray Dalio who started out working on a golf course and now he's got the largest hedge fund in the world, $160 billion, and say how did they get there, what did they do, what turned it around. I want to go to Nobel laureates. I want to make sure I step on the other side of the table and look at the academic view of finance and see what those people have done by studying research over and over again. I want to go to behavioral economics and I want to understand what are the tools that we could use, you and I. We all as humans have bad habits. What are some of the tricks that can get us out of those bad habits? So we can truly get free? So that became my mission and it lasted about four years now, a little more than four years. I interviewed more than 50 people. And then I had to put that into a single book and simplify it. Because I believe that complexity is the enemy of execution, and in finance, everything is made more complex than it really needs to be because the more complex it is, like having a lawyer. If it's too simple, you do it yourself. Having a doctor, you know, to be fair, that's a complex system, so you may need some assistance there. But a lot of times you have things built into the system that make it more complex and people don't know what to do, so I wanted to provide something I could hand to anybody, if they were just beginning the journey, like millennial who's coming out of school and there, like, I don't know how I'm ever gonna get past the student debt, or a baby boomer that's going, oh my god, I took a ton of loss in 2008, I didn't take advantage of the market cause I was scared and what do I do now, 
Tony Robbins. Gosh, there's so many. Let's start with the most basic thing. How about where do most Americans put their money to try to create some form of financial security or freedom long term, whether it be for retirement or before? They put it in the 401k because it's tax efficient. And then where does the money go? Usually into a mutual fund. Why does it go to a mutual fund? Because you and I as average people would think, I've got a job, I've got kids, I've got family, I'm running a business. How am I gonna be a professional investor on the side? Obviously. Somebody whose full-time focus is on that is gonna make more and better decisions, so they're gonna be my active manager, they're gonna pick which stocks, they're gonna put this mutual fund together, I'm gonna see their track record and I'm gonna invest in those guys. It seems so simple. But in reality, what all the research shows, and I got this from Warren Buffett, I got this from Ray Dalio, I got this from David Swenson, who's the number one institutional investor in history from Yale. He took Yale from a $1 billion endowment to $24 billion in 20 years. It's just unheard of. Smartest people in the room, and they all said, Tony, active management does not work except for a few unicorns, and the unicorns are people the average person could never access. You can't get to Ray Dalio. If you have $5 billion and you have $100 million initial investment, that could have got you to him 10 years ago. Today, he won't take your money no matter how much money you have. Because he manages government's money and giant pension funds, so they're gonna have him. Paul Tudor, you can't get money with him. 96% of all mutual funds don't match the market of any 10-year period of time. That means 4% make it. And that 4%, they're always changing. So what's your chance? You go, I'm going to find the 4%. You're not going to do it by going to Morningstar. If you go to Morningstar and find a 5-star account, every trader on earth loves when you buy high, when something is high and then they know it's gonna dash. The account's gonna go, you're gonna sell it and then you're gonna go buy another high account. That's how you lose. I'll give you a metaphor and then I'll answer your question directly about fees. I haven't forgotten. I just wanted to clear up about where fees enter people's lives. Cause people don't think about fees. They just think, well, I've got my 401k. Most people think 401ks don't even have fees. When you read the research, it's mind boggling. So, what's your chance of picking the right mutual fund? Which is what your entire financial future is based on for most Americans? Well, you've got a 4% chance. Let me put that in perspective. Reach all of them. James Al Tucker. I want to ask you about each one of those groups, and you start off very well describing all the myths that are still currently baked into the system. Like, you, when you talk complexity, I hear fees. So for everything that is complex dash, Tony Robbins, you're right on. You're spot on. James Al Tucker, for everything that's complex, you can charge for it because there's some. I don't want to say ignorance, but someone says, oh yeah, I don't understand that so I'm willing to pay for it. So what are the layers of fees that you think the average investor doesn't know but should know, and you describe it very well in this book, so that's one big reason why I encourage people to read this book. But what are some of the ones that shocked you? Tony Robbins Gosh, there's so many. Let's start with the most basic thing. How about where do most Americans put their money to try to create some form of financial security or freedom long term, whether it 
before retirement or before? They put it in the 401k because it's tax efficient. And then where does the money go? Usually into a mutual fund. Why does it go to a mutual fund? Because you and I as average people would think, I've got a job, I've got kids, I've got family, I'm running a business. How am I gonna be a professional investor on the side? Obviously. Somebody whose full-time focus is on that is gonna make more and better decisions, so they're gonna be my active manager, they're gonna pick which stocks, they're gonna put this mutual fund together, I'm gonna see their track record and I'm gonna invest in those guys. It seems so simple. But in reality, what all the research shows, and I got this from Warren Buffett, I got this from Ray Dalio, I got this from David Swenson, who's the number one institutional investor in history from Yale. He took Yale from a $1 billion endowment to $24 billion in 20 years. It's just unheard of. Smartest people in the room, and they all said, Tony, active management does not work except for a few unicorns, and the unicorns are people the average person could never access. You can't get to Ray Dalio. If you have $5 billion and you have $100 million initial investment, that could have got you to him 10 years ago. Today, he won't take your money no matter how much money you have. Because he manages government's money and giant pension funds, so they're gonna have him. Paul Tudor, you can't get money with him. 96% of all mutual funds don't match the market of any 10-year period of time. That means 4% make it. And that 4%, they're always changing. So what's your chance? You go, I'm going to find the 4%. You're not going to do it by going to Morningstar. If you go to Morningstar and find a 5-star account, every trader on earth loves when you buy high, when something is high, and then they know it's gonna dash. The account's gonna go, you're gonna sell it and then you're gonna go buy another high account. That's how you lose. I'll give you a metaphor and then I'll answer your question directly about fees. I haven't forgotten. I just wanted to clear up about where fees enter people's lives. Cause people don't think about fees. They just think, well, I've got my 401k. Most people think 401ks don't even have fees. When you read the research, it's mind-boggling. So, what's your chance of picking the right mutual fund? Which is what your entire financial future is based on for most Americans? Well, you've got a 4% chance. Let me put that in perspective. If you and I went and go play blackjack in Vegas, and you know how to play blackjack, you get the 21, above 21 you bust. It's the closest one to 21. And you get two face cards, which are 10 each. Are you gonna, if your inner idiot somehow says, I wanna get 21. There's only one card that can get me there, it's an ace, out of the entire deck. And you go, hit me, you have an 8% chance of getting an ace and getting blackjack. You only have a 4% chance of getting the right mutual fund just absurd. So not only do they not perform, and by the way, Warren Buffett, who's got a $1 million bet now with Protégé Partners where he's saying you pick five hedge funds, put them together, the best of the best, and I'll bet you buy my investing in the index, which costs me 14 basis as opposed to 3% in fees, I'll bet you that I'm gonna destroy you. And Right now, it's been going on for, what, 8 years? And he's destroying them by, like, 30 or 40 percent. At this stage, right? So how does that get to fees? Well, the average mutual funds fees are 3.1 percent, according to Forbes. Now, when you tell people this, 
They go no, no, no. I'm smarter than that. I pay 1% in fees. No, that's the expense ratio. That's the sticker that they show you on the outside. But Hilton Smith, a gentleman who works for demos, is just brilliant, is an economist. He was very frustrated because he couldn't figure out why is it that the market's going up and my account's not going up proportionately, not even close. And so he finally decided he'd get research time. And he got the research time aside, and he went. And read, I think he had 15 or 16 mutual funds. That he had, and you know, there's a 52 page. Prospectus on each one. And this guy's got a. Degree in economics, and he said it literally took. Him almost six weeks to decipher that there are 17. Different types of fees. They don't call them all fees, but they're out of your pocket, so it's a fee. Right. And nobody pays attention to it. So the 3.1 for the average 401k for people, the average fees there are 4% plus. So if you put this in perspective, when you're at 3%, a lot of people say, well, what does that matter? Well, let me show you what it matters. Most of us know the power of compounding, right? You know. Compounding is how you get wealthy with a small amount of money. If you're willing to have the time and you stay in the game, you can win. But the fees compound. So if you had, you know, let's take. You've got three people and they all start with one dollar, million, or one hundred thousand dollars. You can take it either way. You want it, one hundred thousand dollars, one million dollars, whatever it is. And they decide they're gonna invest, they're 35 years old, they're gonna invest the next 30 years. And all three of them get a 7% return for 30 years. At the end of 30 years, we did it with the one dollar million example, one person's got dollar seven plus million. The others got four million dollars. And the difference is 3%, 2% and 1% fees. The guy that had 1% fees has $7 million. The guy that has, you know, $4 million, $3.3 .3 million less in money, 76% less, that person, that individual paid 3% in fees, doesn't matter what the return was. It's what you get to keep. And so most people have no clue just the layers of fees that are there. So it's shocking. Jack Bogle who's the, you know, founder of Vanguard, been in the business 63 years, I went in to go interview him for 45 minutes, and he actually wrote in my book, he said, Tony comes for 45 minutes, he left 4 hours later. He said it was the most probing and provocative interview of his life. That's saying a lot since he's been interviewed for 63 years on the marketplace, so I obviously got through to him and learned a lot from him. But I mean, he just lays out the math for you, and I put it in the book. If I came to you and said, I wanna do this deal with you, here's what I'll do. I'm gonna Invest your money for you, but here's how it works. You put up the money, you take all the risk. If you lose, you lose. If you lose or win, I get paid. I put no money and I get paid no matter what, and over the life of your investing, the compounding cost of me is between 40 and 60% of all you ever earn. You would say there's no way in a million years I would do that deal. That's the deal that 92 million Americans are taking cause that's the average mutual fund. James Al Tucker, you know, and it's funny because it's such a huge, huge industry, the marketing has programmed everybody. So what I always view it as, it's almost like this tax on everybody who's employed because your boss who's wealthy, say gives you your salary and you see it for three seconds, 
then you put it in your 401k and now it goes straight into the pockets of either the mutual fund managers or the people selling stocks to the mutual funds. So you only see your money for a few seconds and then it's off to rich people again. Tony Robbins, it's true. I'm sure you know, it's pay to play, right? So it's not like, when you go to look at your 401k plan, that even if you believe mutual funds are the right answer, that the best ones are there. It's the ones that paid the most to be there. In order to pay the most to be there, guess who's gonna pay dash? They have to get paid, so guess how they're gonna get their money back? They're gonna charge it to you in all these other fee structures underneath that you don't see that are below the sticker price. You see the sticker price and go 1%, no problem. Right. You don't understand, no, maybe it's 3% or more. James Al Tucker, yeah, people don't see the marketing fees. Sometimes rent they don't see, you know, the mutual funds rent. Tony Robbins, they charge you for the fees they pay to be on your platform. James Al Tucker, right. And dash. Tony Robbins, to get in front of you. James Al Tucker, and also the trading costs, their broker's fees. Tony Robbins, there's more than 17 different fees. I list them all. In there if you really want to. James Al Tucker, yeah. No, I saw that. Tony Robbins, you want to get pissed or you want to get depressed or you want to just know what to look for. It's there for you, just one little box all at once. James Al Tucker, yeah, so there was the fees that was kind of the biggest aha in terms of what people should be looking at in terms of their financial management. Tony Robbins, can I just interject one thing for you? James Al Tucker, sure. Tony Robbins, it's, I mean, this I didn't go into as much depth into in the book, but I want to plant the seed. It's even worse if you go to a broker or wealth manager. There's, like 312 different names for what a broker is today. A non-fiduciary, right, is what I call them. So if you go to that person, they might say the most common thing you hear in the marketplace today is, I'll only charge you 1% on equities and I'll charge you nothing on bonds. If you ever really want to make yourself crazy, study bond math, because they don't charge you anything on the surface. They don't charge you a commission, but you might be paying 3, 4 percent or more on a bond, right, because of all the fees that are done at the trading desk level, at the level before they disclose any of this to you. And it's Dash. James Al Tucker, sure. This was Lehman Brothers. Tony Robbins, another world where the system is just organized. You know, and rather than bitch about the system. The system is designed for the people that design the system to prosper and their shareholders to prosper. It's not first, it's not designed first for the investor. And so if you're aware of that, you don't have to be pissed. You don't have to be angry. You can just go, I'm not gonna be one of those. The goal of this book is to make you the chess players or the chess piece. To empower you. Nine lies that are marketed to you. You know the truths, you'll never be taken advantage of again. James Al Tucker, yeah. And I think it's important to realize that. You also mentioned the taxes. People pay too much in taxes. They don't even really know all the different ways in which they're taxed. Tony Robbins, the ultra wealthy know that completely, so I have a whole section on that because, when I interviewed these 50 plus billionaires, Nobel Prize winners, the best of the best, Every single one of them had things that were different when they looked at investment, but I found certain themes were universal, 
and one of them was tax efficiency. Because, again, you only get to spend what you keep. I paid, you know, well over $60 million in taxes in recent years, I'll just put it that way, so I've paid plenty of personal taxes, and I believe in paying your taxes, but I also know that, by law, their job is to try and get as much money as they can from as many people as they can and, simultaneously, your job is to legally and ethically keep as much as you can because the more you keep, the more you can compound, the more you can now take care of your family, yourself or you give to charity, you get to direct it. You decide where it goes. And unless you like the way government spends money, then you probably want to get smart in that area. So I have a whole chapter on secrets of the ultra wealthy because the ultra wealthy know how to compound tax free, not just tax deferred, but tax free. It's kind of like a rich man's Roth with no limits on it. So you're able to literally accumulate money. I'll give you a perspective. Here's the impact of taxes in the form of a metaphor. Imagine a dollar doubled, one dollar doubled, the next year it's two dollars, next year it's four dollars, eight dollars, sixteen dollars, right? So if you double a dollar twenty times, it becomes one million forty eight thousand dollars. And that's pretty awesome. But if you were only paying 33% tax along the way, that $1,048,000, I ask people what do you think it would be? And people go, well, 33 and you had $1,048,000, I don't know. You'd probably have $650,000 left over, something like that, right, $500,000 to $700,000. No doesn't work that way. Those bites of the apple along the way kill your ability to accumulate. So, instead of $1,048,000, you end up with $28,000. You're only off by almost $1,000,000, right? A little more than $1,000,000. And in real life, you're not gonna double your money every year, right? So that's not an accurate metaphor but it gives you a sense of the power of what compounding fees or compounding taxes does, and so you want to reduce that to the minimum you possibly can. Warren Buffett does that. Warren Buffet talks about paying taxes, but if you see how he's done things, he's been very, very smart about how he's done things his entire life. Economically. James Al Tucker, oh yeah. If you never sell a stock, you never have to pay taxes on it. Tony Robbins, that's part of it, but he's also picked an insurance company for his source of capital for a good reason, because they have very strong tax efficiencies, much greater than most businesses. So you hear about somebody that's got $10 billion, and they get a $200 million life insurance policy. You say, why would they need a $100 million life insurance policy? They can write a check for it. They're not looking for the life insurance policy. They're looking for the tax efficiency that that provides, that allows them to take money that's under that umbrella and invest it in an environment where they can literally invest it, not have any taxes taken out, they can borrow it while they're alive. And when they die, the insurance policy pays it off. So in essence, they're able to get their goals 50% faster in that 50% tax bracket. So I show somebody who's not wealthy, who's in a lower tax bracket. How'd you like to hit your goals 10 years sooner? How'd you like to achieve your goals 25 to 50% faster? Show you exactly how to do it. And really, that's all IRS sanctioned and supported. It's very specific in the law. It's not being skirted or gray or anything of that nature. I always tell people. When people say ignorance is bliss, no, ignorance is 
Poverty. Ignorance is pain. Ignorance will create real challenges for your physical health, your financial health, your emotional health. You don't want to be ignorant in these subjects, and finance is in there. You've got to master it or it'll master you. James Al Tucker, well, you had a great story in there where you asked some people their goals, their financial goals, and one person said $1 billion. And on the one hand, this seems admirable. It's good to have great goals, but you turn it around and show that actually that might not be such a great goal to have. Because he's making it harder for himself to achieve his goal, and you actually kind of break it down and show that what he really wanted, if he really achieved all his financial goals, was $10 million. And so, again, we're talking big numbers. And this is just one example. You have people with smaller goals, but that was kind of an eye-opener. That people don't really know what their financial independence goal was. I mean, here was a guy who had a 99% difference what he thought was his goal and what was his actual goal when he broke it down what he wanted. And that was actually probably the biggest aha moment for me in the book. Tony Robbins, wow. When you go through the book, I take you through seven steps, and the first step is you've got to tap into the power and make the most important financial decision of your life, which is to stop becoming a consumer and become an owner. Become an investor. But you've got to automate it and you've got to put it into a system so that the percentage you're putting aside can grow in the future even if you don't have the money right now, so I lay out how to do that. And the second step is you've got to become an insider because you've got to know the rules of the game before you get in the game. Otherwise, that person with experience is going to end up with your money because you don't have the experience. They're going to get your money. That's just how it works. So that's what those nine myths are. Then the third step is make the game winnable. Which is really critical. I'm glad you noticed it. It's okay to have giant goals in life, but have you ever set a goal and then your brain goes bullshit? Like, that's not gonna happen. Your conscious mind says it and then your unconscious goes no way in. Hell. When you have absolute certainty about something. It goes into your unconscious and your brain figures out how to make it happen. You watch a great athlete, a great business person. You gotta get yourself into a place of certainty. That's the edge in life. When you have that edge, you'll find the answer. If the answer is not in front of you, if you can't find the way, you'll make the way. That's how it works. So when people set giant goals and it sounds good, and sexy, there's nothing wrong with that, but I say, when you get your finances, you've got to know your real numbers, and what I do is I show people, there should be a short term, a medium and a long term goal, and that sounds really basic, but I'm very specific about it. I say to people, is there a difference when I use the word financial security? to you than say financial independence or financial freedom or absolute financial freedom? And people say, yeah, it does feel different. Which one sounds like the highest? Absolute financial freedom. Which one is the lowest? They'll say, well, maybe financial security. That's a basic need. So I ask people, if you go to a financial planner, this is a tough thing because I'm so supportive of people that are fiduciaries, people that are trained and are legally required to take care of you, to look out for you. If they tell you to buy Microsoft today in the morning and they buy it later cheaper that night, they've got to give you the stock. That's the law. That's what a fiduciary is. Most people don't 
even know what the word fiduciary means. I'm supportive of the financial industry immensely, but I'm looking for the people that are both fiduciaries, but also are sophisticated. You can be required by law to look out for someone, you can be totally sincere and you can be sincerely wrong, right? So I look for sophistication in somebody who's a fiduciary. So when I say that, the reason I bring it up is, if you're in a place where you're trying to get the most return you possibly can, and you sit down with the average financial planner today, there's a study I quote in the book. It's mind-boggling. It's from a financial planning association. They did a survey, it was three years ago, and they said how many of you actually have a financial plan? And 47% acknowledged they didn't have one. It's like the cobbler's son doesn't have shoes. And I can't believe they admitted it, but to be fair to them, the world's gotten so complex, people don't know where to go, and you know, it's changing, they don't know what to do. James Al Tucker, well, also to be fair to them, they're broke. Right. Like, so many people have lost their jobs. The entire economy has been demoted, right? Income has gone down versus inflation, student. Tuitions have gone up versus inflation, everything. Else has gone up versus inflation. So how do you deal with that? Tony Robbins, well, that's a larger problem and let's do that in one second. But I want to plant a seed that capitals more valuable than manpower today. That's a fact. Because of the efficiencies of technology, capital will give you a greater reward than the hours of work, unless you don't do hours of work. You bring something of value that's beyond technology, and that's human intelligence. So we're in a knowledge economy now, we're not in a labor economy now. And labor, we can argue about it, but if you and I were to say this, 200 years ago, 80% of America was farmers, right? And so today, with less than, what, 3% of us dash? James Al Tucker, 2%, yeah. Tony Robbins, we provide all the food for the whole planet if we want to, and so it looks bad in the beginning, and trust me, I understand. I take care of people. I feed people, so I know what the disruption is out there and I've been one of those people. That's where I started out, not being able to have food for myself. So I'm beyond emotionally connected to it. But I also understand that our job is to retool ourselves. If you're going to listen to a politician who's gonna tell you, oh, we're gonna get you more jobs. They're all being shipped overseas, they're full of it. They're being shipped into factories run by robots. They're gonna be shipped to there. Ten years from now, who's gonna hire a truck driver when in three? Or four or five years, you can have a driver that goes 24 hours a day, never gets tired, never breaks down, doesn't have any accidents, right, self-driving trucks, you've got 3.5 million people out there that no one is preparing for what's coming. They're gonna come back and say, oh, those rich people. It's not rich people. It's progress. The world changes. Just like we didn't all stay farmers. Thank God. It used to take 80% of your time to have enough of your hours of the day to have food on your table. So I think there's an issue there. It's a major issue I'm passionate about, which is we must become more valuable. Each of us as individuals have to do that. The only way that you're gonna be able to earn more in the future. The only way you're gonna have a way to protect yourself is not to go, those rich people, cause if you're saying those rich people, I wanna give you a little reality check. The people that talk about rich people usually have very small incomes, 
maybe $30,000 a year very often. Struggling, and $30,000 a year in income makes you the 1%. Cause you can't say those 1% over there and go out there and drink your Starbucks and type on your Apple computer there. In front of you when, in reality, two-thirds of the planet lives on $2.50 a day, $900 a year. So what you're spending on one damned Starbucks is more than they have for their whole family every year, and that's two-thirds of the planet. So isn't it convenient to go, those rich people, if you really care and that's what you do, you better think about all the other people on the planet who literally, you are the richest on earth. If you make $30,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of earners on the planet. That means you are the 1%, not the 99%. So people conveniently divide whatever makes them feel good, and I say, let's you and I together. Say there are people that abuse the system. There are people that have screwed us all over. I understand that. We got to make sure that's dealt with. But my God, if you spend all your time doing that, you're missing your capacity of doing what's within you and you're living in the greatest time to be alive to really add value. But it's gonna require retooling. You're gonna have to say, I'm not gonna go back to that manufacturing job. I'm gonna see where opportunities. There are tons of industries and businesses the opportunities growing geometrically. I'm gonna go educate myself in the world we live in today. We can all self-educate ourselves, no matter where we live in the world. I mean, when I worked with President Clinton, another guy said, we ought to communicate by electronic mail. Have you checked out this email thing? I've got this AOL account. He goes, I've heard about that. The President of the United States did not have an email account. That was only a few decades ago. Now, some Maasai warrior who's living in the middle of Kenya in Africa there, he's got more computing power than the President does. He can satellite link, he can download courses from MIT, he can do trading, he can do whatever the hell he wants to at this stage. So we live in a world, I'm not willing to buy into the story of, oh my god, these people have done this to us. I know that's true. I know that we've been screwed royally, all of us. But to spend my time more on that old story, I'd rather spend my time on the solution. Every great person I know spends 1% of the time on the problem and 99% of the time on the solution, so I think the solution to what you're talking about, we've all got to do our part to take care of those who we're much better off than, and that's not just in this country, that's around the world. I think we all have that responsibility, and I'm an active participant in that process. I don't forget my roots. But I also think we gotta make sure that we constantly individually say what can we control. Cause people get depressed, people get angry, people get sad when they have three patterns of thinking. Number one, whatever you focus on, you feel. If you focus on what you can't control as your habit, you're gonna be angry, depressed or sad, and most people do. If you focus on what you don't have versus what you do have, you're gonna feel empty, frustrated, depressed. If you focus on the past as opposed to what you can do right now, you're gonna be completely disempowered. Every one of my seminars, I've got 6,000 to 10,000 people at an average event. I'll ask people always this question. Whole room. I've got people usually from, you know, 30, 40 countries, I translate three or four languages with headsets simultaneously. It's like the UN. 
And I go, how many of you in this room, in this room right now, know somebody who's on antidepressants and they're still depressed? 98% of the room raises their hand and from all countries around the world. Now, how can people be depressed if they're taking antidepressants? Some of them are taking multiples and their max because they haven't dealt with the real sources. The real sources you're constantly focusing on. What you can't control, what's missing from your life, and you're controlling on a time frame you can't do anything about. You're gonna be depressed or you're gonna be pissed, one of the two. So I'm passionate, as you may notice, about let's focus on. I can't stand the system as abusing people. I wrote this damn book and I'm giving away all the damn thing. I'm not gonna get a dime out of this. You know, I'm giving, I decided when I was going along the way, I saw last summer, I'm writing this book, and somebody fed me when I was 11 years old and I never forgot it. It changed my life. It made me believe that strangers care. So at 17, I went out, fed two families. Next year I wanted to double it, four, then eight, then sixteen, then I got my friends involved and, you know, the last fifteen, eighteen years, I've fed two million people a year through my foundation. The last five years, I've been able, my wife and I together set a goal which was we're gonna match it. So we've been feeding two million a year ourselves plus two million in the foundation. That's 42 million people in 37 years. James Al Tucker, well, and you dash. Tony Robbins, so I want you to know paying it forward is what I'm about, but I saw last summer, Congress comes and cuts food stamps they don't call them food stamps. Anymore, 8.7 billion dollars. That's the equivalent of every family that's part of that system not eating for a week once a month for 12 months. And the idea that Congress is just gonna go away. I don't go, oh, those people should fend for themselves. My view is something's got to be done. So I said, you know what? I'm working my ass off for four years on this book, but you know, what if I took all the money? I got a great advance on this book, and all the future. I don't wait and see if books sell, I just write a check up front for everything I'll ever get out of this book, and how many people can I feed? It was, like, 10 million people. I'm, like, that's incredible. And then as time got by, I got more and more so now I'm feeding, I say in the book. 50, but I'm actually feeding 55 million people this year alone, and I'm working with Feeding America. They're delivering the food, the number one hunger relief organization in the United States, and they're working to get matching funds with me dash. That's why I'm doing it, to get 100 million people fed. So I'm very passionate about taking care of people. But I'm also very passionate about people developing the muscle of what they can do, and I think we have to do both. The problem with the political system is one system says the whole system's broken, it's the system. The other group says everybody should pull up their bootstraps. Bullshit. We have to do both. And I think we all have that ability if we educate ourselves. And that's why this book I came in and showed where the problems were, but I also showed you what the solutions were. James Al Tucker, and you do say people need to develop their inner game. So it's not just about knowing where the fees are, where the taxes are, and you don't say it in this book, but you say it in one of your seminars, if you ask lousy questions, you're gonna get lousy answers. And that's part of this inner game that you're referring to, and it's really true. And you see it, then, when you're calling up these 50 people who are the ultra-wealthy, 
my guess is. They're not saying, why is that guy richer than me? They're probably saying, how can I just improve the process of what I'm doing? Tony Robbins, well, here's something I want people to know. It's a perfect example. Generalizing any group of people is always a mistake, men, women, Christians, Jews, Muslims, I don't care which it is. Rich people, poor people, there's so many layers of that. When I hear the president talk about millionaires and billionaires, I laugh. They're not in the same universe. You know, one million dollars, a million seconds ago, twelve days ago, to give you an idea, a million seconds. A billion seconds ago is thirty-two years ago. That's the difference between a million and a billion. It's just like people's idea that these are the same thing as the biggest story in the world. There's so many people in this country that work their tail off and somebody's mad at them. I will tell you these billionaires who I convinced to give me 45 minutes, the average interview was 3 hours. I'll give you an example. I went in with Carl Icahn, who's just an incredible force of nature. People think that he's a selfish guy. He actually is truly driven to maximize value for everybody involved. And virtually every company he's ever been in that he's been successful in, he's made more money for investors. But he is a very passionate guy. So I go in to have the meeting with him, and I've got a big video crew cause I filmed these, and he agreed to it, and he goes, I don't want a video crew. I said, wait a second. I don't care. I don't want a video crew. Get them out of here. Get them out of here now. Okay, well, I'll bring my audio team in. No audio team. Okay, well, bring me a pencil. You've got 10 minutes. But to give you an idea, Carl, who seems on the outside so rough, rough because people try to take advantage of him, rough because people are gonna write something terrible. When he got high, really was just trying to help real investors, this isn't a game for me. This is a game to help those people really win. He gave me almost three hours of his time. At the end, he's like, let me show you what else. And here's a guy that, that day, made two billion dollars selling his Netflix stock, but again, remember I think he put 30 million dollars in to make two billion dollars. Remember a million versus a billion? Get perspective, it's like different universes. He wrote a tweet about Apple being undervalued and Apple went up 17 billion dollars in the next two hours. I mean, they call him the master of the universe. If you'd invested with him in the last 14 years, you would have had a 1,600% return versus 75% for the S&P during that time. So these people, I want you to know, open their doors. These people gave me access when they saw that what I was really gonna do was empower individual investors. So they do give a damn. Generalizing about people is an easy way to not look at yourself. I say stop that stuff. But let me come back to what you asked a long way back. James Al Tucker, that's okay. I always like the tangents. Tony Robbins, the one about the goals. The goals is really important because if you go, okay, I need one dollar billion. Once you figure out what one billion dollars really is, that million versus a billion, it can be a little overwhelming. It sounds sexy. That's not to say you shouldn't make a billion, but do you need a billion to be financially secure? So this young man that you're talking about, and I get this many times, I need one billion dollars. I go, let's break that down. Tell me everything you want in your life. So he starts walking me through, well, 
I want an island. Okay, I've got one of those. You wanna know? How much it costs? I'll tell you, right? But I said. But you know, I did that when I was, like, 26 years. Old, 27 years old, and I owned it for a lot of years, I. Spent a fortune building it up and I go there about. Two weeks out of the year, and the rest of the year. It's the number one resort in Fiji and it's a top resort. In the top 10, Oprah last year says it's the greatest place on earth to go, recommended her top picks. Recommendation, and I'm real proud of it, but. Guess who has the great lifestyle? The people who. Go there. I paid for the damn thing and, you know, they go. There and have a great time. So I said, maybe. You wanna go to my friend, Richard Branson. He'll. Rend you his island, right? Here's what it'll cost you. You want a Gulfstream jet? Do you need a Gulfstream? How often are you gonna fly? Where? Are you gonna fly? Well, down to Florida, down. To Key Biscayne. Okay, well, let's look at the cost. To charter. You could have a Gulfstream jet you can. Charter down there. Let's put that, how many? Times a year are you gonna go? So when you start? Breaking that down versus a $60 million jet, when? He's all said and done, the entire amount he would. Need is less than $10 million versus $1 billion. I think he could still make his $1 billion. Maybe he will, but why not ring the bell and win at $10 million? And all the rest of it is gravy. So here is how I do it with people, though. Rather than saying billion or trillion, I say, what do you think it's gonna take to be financially secure? Independent or free? And most people have no clue. Some people have calculated what they think it's gonna take to have an income for life. So let's start with this. I've learned that when the brain has certainty, it becomes more aggressive. You know, I took a pistol shooting program from the United States Army when I was 24, and I went to a general and I said, General, I can take any training you have in the army, cut the training time in half and increase the competency. He said, You're crazy. James Al Tucker, you did this at 24. Tony Robbins, I was just 24. I negotiated with this general. I got top secret clearance. I didn't know I was going to pistol shooting. I didn't want to do pistol shooting. I never shot a gun. I just said any training program. So he gives me a four day pistol shooting program. I asked him, I'm a little freaked out cause it wasn't what I was expecting. It thought it'd be like a 10 week thing or, you know, four days. The armies refined it for, I think at the time, 60 years or something like that, and the army qualified, a third of the people didn't qualify, right? Knew all the statistics, so I had to beat that. So I said, give me the best expert in all the armed services and give me the best from all three service, the best marksmen. I brought them in did this process of modeling. I put them side by side and I said, let's see what you're doing. Stop. I just did what you do in your head. I just compared what they did internally and externally to find what was idiosyncratic versus what was consistent across all of them. When I knew what was consistent, here was the secret to what made it work. First of all, they said, to me, let's see you shoot, cause I was 24 years old, I'm in a t-shirt and a pair of jeans and the guys like, these guys are 35, 33, the best in the military. Right, and they're like, how long you been shooting? I said, shooting what, I don't shoot guns. And you're gonna teach us? I said, no. You're gonna teach me. So they made me shoot. 
at 45 caliber pistol and, you know, I'd never shot a gun before, and it has quite a bit of kick and I put a bullet in the ceiling and it didn't really help very much. But what I did at the end was I learned what they all did and I created a training program that induced certainty. When I got up there to do this thing, I'm shaking. Looking at this thing from 50 yards away trying to shoot it. That seems like forever. What am I gonna do? So what I did, all of these guys, I found out. Mentally, I found out, unconsciously by interviewing them, I asked what are you doing right now, what are you doing in your head, okay, you're bringing the gun, what happened just then, and then after doing this for a day, I found out all of them had one thing in common, they brought the target closer, mentally so it seemed bigger and closer to them, which made them more certain. James Al Tucker, how did they do that? What do you mean? Tony Robbins, mentally they pictured the target coming closer. Before they went to shoot, so the target was here. Instead of way there. Every single one of them did it and most of them were conscious of it, the others were not conscious of it. It was an unconscious tool. It's like, when people are good at something, sometimes they don't know how they do it. It just happens in milliseconds. So guess what I did when I did the pistol shooting program. I figured everything they did and the order they did it, the best of all, but then I had people pick up a gun the very first time and I never let them shoot it until they'd done everything perfectly in sequence, and the first time they shot the gun, it was from here to that wall. It's like, four feet away. Boom, right. Through the center. Holy shit, I'm good at this. Right. Boom, 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 boom. Now I take it. Out ten feet. Now I take it out fifteen feet, and we. Qualified one hundred percent of the people in a day and a. Half, and the army's only getting seventy percent. I. Triple the number of people that got experts, and. The colonel of the project, the two-star general. He said this is the first breakthrough in pistol. Shooting since World War I. So I learned from that experience way back when. About certainty. So if you've got this target and. You make it this giant target that's 50 miles away. It. Might sound sexy, but it's not gonna feel good. So. Here's what I do with people is how would you feel. Let's just start with this. How would you feel if you could have these five things paid for and never have to work again? In other words, you could have an income for a life without working that paid for these five things. Anything else you needed income for, you'd work for, maybe your part-time, full-time doing something you love, but these five things would be covered. The five things are your mortgage. So you never, ever, as long as you live, have to pay for your home, your utilities, you never have to worry about that as long as you live, food for your family, covered forever, all your transportation costs and your basic insurance, not everything, but basic. How would you feel? Well, that would feel incredible. Would you feel financially secure? Really secure. Cool. Let me show you what that number is. Let's actually break down that number. And I have people do it and it blows their mind. Because the number is so small by comparison. It's usually about 60% of what they need overall. And so instead of, say a person goes to a financial planner and they say, I make $100,000 a year. How much will I need to retire? They say, well. Do you want a $100,000 income? Most people say it's 10 times your income, which is absurd. 10 times $100,000, you need $1 million. That says that you're gonna put $1 million aside and get 10% on it in a secure environment. Where is 
That gonna happen? That's decades ago. That's not happening. So it's really 20 times if you're thinking at 5%. Okay, so $100,000. I need $2 million. That seems like a big number. But if I start to break down what you need to be financially secure, I might discover that, no, what you really need is maybe $60,000 of income, and that $60,000 times 20 is $1.2 million. I'd say 60% of what it's gonna take to be secure. Now, that's not everything, but oh my god, if you're a baby boomer and you lost a ton of money, you can get secure still in the short period of time. You have, even with very little compounding. If you're somebody, a millennial, you're gonna blow through that, but at least when you win, you ring the bell and go, I got it, and that builds certainty. Right. So now we can take the target a little further. Now you can be even more certain. Now let's go for financial independence. Let's make it so you have the same income you have today without working. And then let's maybe look at more income than you have today. What would it take? Like, what's a dream for you? And instead of saying I have to go buy the jet or buy the boat, most people who buy the boat or jet will tell you the best day was the day they bought it and the day they sold it. We all know the phrase that they use. Why not lease it? Charter it only when you need it. Let's talk about that cost. And you might discover you can have a billionaire lifestyle, a millionaire lifestyle, but you don't have to have one dollar billion or one million dollars. So once you know what your number is, then I've got an app that comes with the book, it's free, and you just pump in your numbers and you can play with it until you come up with a plan that's real and then I give you five ways to improve that plan including tax efficiency because for example I moved I'm fortunate enough to have multiple homes in my life I travel all over the world and I try to have homes near where I work so I don't have to always live in a hotel you're in my main home but I moved here about a year and a half ago because I just sat down. California raised the rates to 13 and one third on the highest income people. And because high income people are only a small number of votes, they made it retroactive. Now, you have every right to raise the tax. I've paid the tax no matter what they've done. But when they made it retroactive, I mean, I play by the rules and then after the fact you're gonna penalize me and screw me over? That was it for me. I looked at 88 properties in three states I six and a half weeks, and I moved to Palm Beach, Florida. I would have thought. Florida, alligators and old people. Look out this window. The weather is just the most incredible dash. This is the greatest seat in the world. Don't tell anybody. James Al Tucker, I'm gonna guess you talked to a lot of real estate experts as well. Tony Robbins, you bet I did. James Al Tucker, because there's a Tony Robbins method I'm starting to get here, which is that you're gonna talk to all the top experts in the world, figure out kinda the key things that's similar to all of them and then write a book or buy a house or build a system around it. Tony Robbins, and that's what I did, but the reason I tell you that is because the amount of money I saved in annual state taxes alone by living here is more than what this home will cost you, which is, you know, a 20,000 square foot home on 200 feet of ocean from the water and two acres. So if you can imagine, it's not a cheap home. All of it's paid for dash. In fact, it's not like payments. It's paid off in six years of tax savings, the house is free. So why would I live in California where I only live 
90 days a year anyway and let somebody do that? So there are ways, a lot of people say, well, I can't move. I show people how you don't have to wait till you retire. There's some things you could do that could radically improve your life. And I never knew I was gonna improve my life. Forget the financial improvement. If I would have known this was here, I think I would have been here 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier. My wife can go to the greatest places, the greatest restaurants, the greatest everything, total privacy. I live on an island. I used to go to Fiji to do that where my island is. Now I've got it here as my main home. So it's really looking at your goals in a new way. It's saying how do I get the lifestyle, not how do I have to have the things. You own the things too, you're welcome to do it, but I'd like to show you how to get there faster and you can get the things later on. If you just want to own them for some reason, but most of that is ego. Nothing wrong with ego, but there's a price of ego. James Al Tucker, well, there's ego, but then there's also relief. You know, so you want to get relief first, then you can feed the ego if you have some, a little left. Over. Tony Robbins, maybe it's not ego. For some people, it's accomplishment. For some people, it's a challenge. I mean people assume people's motivations. They project the motivations on them. They always project the best motivations on themselves and terrible on other people. But if you really get under it for some people, it's just the game. When I wrote this book, Money, Master the Game. You can't imagine the negative feedback I got from some people on social media, like, oh, Tony's sold out. He's selling a book on money. First of all, I'm giving away all the damned money. He's saying money's a game. It is. The richest people on earth all know it's a game. Why else is somebody like Steve Wynn, who's a buddy of mine? Right got billions and billions of dollars, he still works 12, 14 hours a day. Cause it's a game. There are rules to games. Not all games are frivolous. And you know what? Some people sit on the sidelines of the game and watch cause games are a reflection of your life. Some people get in the game. Some people play to win. Some people just kind of try a little. Some people dabble. How are you gonna play? And I tell people this subject. Money, this is an area you can't afford, that's a game you can't afford to lose. You've got to master this game and not let it master you. James Al Tucker, so let me ask you this. Let's say you were dropped off in the middle of anywhere, okay, and you had nothing. And this is what's happening to many people in America now. They're in their 50s. They're fired from their jobs. 47% don't have a financial plan. They don't know what they're doing. What would you do right now if you were just from scratch? Tony Robbins. Well, I almost had to do that once before. I went through a divorce. I married my woman when I married her she'd been married twice before me had children from both of them i adopted the kids i was 24 and had a 17 year old son and an 11 year old daughter and a five year old instantly james al tucker wait you were 24 and you had a 17 year old son tony robbins she was 11 years my senior 11 and a half years my senior She'd been married twice. So I took both sets of kids. They're one of the greatest gifts in my life. Brought them into my life, made them my own, but that was kind of a wild thing to have a 17 year old son when you're 24 and an 11 year old daughter instantly and a 5 year old and 
then a child on the way. So that changed my life at a level you can't imagine. And I was living in the Del Mar Castle, which is in the city of Del Mar, which is in Southern California near San Diego. It's a, what do you call it, a home that's been built out of pieces of castles in Europe. It's a very famous place, and I was fairly wealthy, I thought, at that state. When I got divorced, she got an eight times multiple on all my companies and the market had dropped, but I still had to give an eight times multiple and some of those were companies that were like a doctor. If I don't work, it doesn't happen. So, you know, I ended up paying $42 million when I didn't have $42 million. The market had dropped through the floor, and I paid $1 million a year before I ate. So I had to start over. Literally, at 39, 40 years old and rebuild things. Again. But I did, I never did it for the money. I did it because I loved what I did and then I just found a way, if you can help millions of people, then you can do well. If you can help 12 people, you can do well emotionally and spiritually, maybe you can do well financially. It depends on what the service is you charge for, but my thing is help millions. I can help millions and don't have to worry about money. It's like, don't back up from there. But the answer to your question was it's easy, I'll say, oh, this is what I would do. I can tell you that I was at the base where it looked like I was gonna end up with absolutely nothing, and I went back and had a skill set, obviously. I use that skill set, but the psychological part is the hard part for those people. What you're describing, it's not that they can't do it. It's the idea of starting over when you're 40 or 50. In my case, to go back on the road and live on the road again to build things back up. It's, like, I don't have it in me is the story I told. Myself. James Al Tucker, did you feel you didn't have the energy? Tony Robbins, not to start over. Not after I spent a lifetime of helping millions of people and then see all that go. Because I wanted to have a divorce, because I was unhappy and I couldn't make this person a partner. If it was real estate, it had been easy, divided in half. But eight times multiple? At that time, thirteen companies, so it was just, it was onerous to say the least. But here's the beauty of it. It made me stronger, it made me better, made me who I am. Today, which I wouldn't trade for anything on earth. People can take away what you have. They can't. Take away who you become. And who you become. Will make you either really happy or really sad. And so my view to those people, I deal with those. People all the time, is you have to retool. This is. The bottom line. You know, 50 years old is the. Halfway mark. You might say, no it's not, you know. The average person lives to 85. Well, when you. Think about how much you learn, how fast you learn. When you're a little kid compared to how you are. Today, I can do more with my pinky today than I used to be able to do when I was 20 working 20 hours a day because I've got relationships and exposure and I've got mindset and insights and things like that. You take away everything and I will rebuild it again. So that mindset for those individuals is to say I have to accept that that chapter is closed and I gotta open a new one. And you've got two choices, give up, what do people do when they get paid? They either give up, they die or they're driven. I chose to be driven, and that's a choice all of us have to make, and the drive has got to say I don't like being, no one likes being born where you're. Birthday allows you to, you know, coming out of college in 2008, 2009 or a depressed economy. Would have been nicer to be coming out, I mean. 
people that were, for example, retiring in the 1980s were happy campers. Those who were retiring in the early 2000s were homeless campers, you know. And it had nothing to do with them. It was just the times we're in. Like, who wants to be born in 1929? Or come of age in 1929? Well, guess what? We all have winters in our life. Culturally they happen. About every 80 years. We go in a cycle, 20 year cycles, and you study those, you see them. What we have to do is figure out how to take advantage of the winter. So some people freeze to death in the winter, other people learn to ski and snowboard and be close to their family. I say the beautiful thing about economic tough times is it makes us remember that we need each other. Right, that's the real value. Now, so many people use it to tear people apart. I don't see that as a solution. When I saw in 2008 or when 9-11 happened, I saw people with flags on their cars used to be spitting on each other, but they're all Americans. When I worked with President Clinton, he said, you know, my biggest problem is we don't have an external enemy back in those days. He goes, you know, we don't have a Soviet Union. There's nothing of that nature. James Al Tucker, so I wanted to ask you about that. So he calls you up, right, and he needs help with something. Whatever it is. What happened then? Tony Robbins, well, I was at a friend of mine's named Peter Grubers, who was the chairman of Sony and Columbia Pictures and TriStar really brilliant man. Great friend of mine to this day. And he said, the president's on the phone. And so I picked up the phone and the president started talking to me and shared with me some of the friends that he had and he said, I'm in a tough place. This is in his first term. That's when he won with his landslide on if the economy's stupid, but he made a bunch of decisions that he felt were quality decisions but they weren't great for the economy and if you remember he lost the congress and senate both houses were controlled by republicans and he was being underscored as this incredibly weak person and he said i'd like you to come to camp david and this is christmas eve and he said i'd love you to come to camp david and have this meeting with me, and I said, Mr. President, I said, the privilege to serve you as an American, but I just said, I want you to know if you're looking for a mouthpiece or someone to tell you what you believe, I'm not it cause I'm not a fan. Peters. Sitting there and he's, like, you just told the President of the United States you're not a fan. I said, I'm not saying that to be mean. It would be a privilege to serve you, but if you're looking for somebody who's gonna tell you the same thing everybody else is telling you, I'm the wrong guy. He goes, no, that's exactly it. I've heard you speak your piece. And I said, I'm not saying I'm right either. I'm just gonna give you another point of view. So I met him and fell in love with the man because he really really cares about human beings. You know, his legacy did intend with the presidency, as you know, with the Clinton initiative, and he's just extraordinary, not only communicator and a brilliant mind, but he's a giant heart. But, you know, that's what started my relationship coaching with him. James Al Tucker, well, you brought up Clinton he's the very first blurb in your book, and I'm thinking how did that start? Like, what advice did you give to the President of the United States? Not that you're not qualified to give advice to the President of the United States, but what was the discussion like? If I was a fly on the wall, what would I have heard? Tony Robbins, well, I can't tell you the things I shared with him. 
personally cause I don't share these. One of the reasons I get the calls I do is I don't share private people's information unless they share it. But I can tell you that he was having a tough time at that time and he needed help because nothing seemed to be working. Nothing seemed to be working. Gaining him traction. I mean, he was holding a certain way, and one thing I shared with him is, I said, honestly, Mr. President, if you don't do anything, the story will change because the story will become old. If you do something really good, people are gonna find something wrong. If you do something really wrong, they'll manage to find something good. If you do nothing, I'm not suggesting you do nothing, but when you're feeling like nothing will work, if you do nothing, it'll change. Now, if you do something active to demonstrate who you are and that you've got real muscle, you don't want these people pushing you around, you know, you've got a different approach to things, and so, we went to lots of different discussions and details, but that relationship, lasted through later in his career when I got a phone call saying, they're gonna impeach me in the morning. What should I do? True story. And I said, could you have called me sooner? Was the first thing I said. But President Clinton is one of the most unique, intelligent, caring, effective communicators that I know of and knows more about more subjects that affect human beings than just about anybody you'll ever meet, and you cannot be in his presence and not feel like you are the only thing on earth. On the other side of the aisle, maybe Reagan, Reagan was amazingly engaging. I got to work with him very briefly. Of those two human beings, I've never met two more human beings that have been more powerful. President Obama is incredibly smart and intelligent and a great communicator, but has not been able to cross the aisle, or has chosen not to, whereas both Reagan and Clinton did, and I think that's a difference in leadership style. James Al Tucker, I wanted to ask about a couple different things. One is Dash. Tony Robbins, by the way, I want you to know I support the President, current president. I want to make sure that's clear. I voted for him initially and I think he's a genius man, but my comments are really related. Not politically so much as what does it take for any of us to be effective? We have to be able to influence people that don't think like us. If you only influence people that think like you do, then you divide yourself, your company your family, your nation in half, and it doesn't matter if you think you're right or not. Even if you are right. One of the things I've learned about the most effective communicators on earth is they've been able to enter other people's worlds better than other people, and so you can't influence somebody if you don't know what already influences them. And you can't influence somebody when you're judging them, and so I think that's one of the challenges. Not only for our president, but for both parties right. Now, we've become so polarized that, when you look at economics, it's hard to get anything done when both parties are polarized over so many different issues, and it's because it used to be. People would fight like hell and then go have a beer together. Now they fight like hell, and that's all they do is fight like hell, you know. James Al Tucker, well, there's a bridge between that and in your book where basically all these ultra wealthy guys that you interview, one thing that stands out to me is they all admit they don't know anything. So they don't know what's gonna happen five minutes from now or five years from now, so they have asset allocation strategies. You call it the all-weather asset allocation strategy, and I think this is true for most areas of life. We really don't know what's gonna happen next. So on politics, it's not worth fighting with people, 
but rather building consensus. And you relate that to the inner game. When you say it's an important to create wealth, it's important to be the servant of money is essentially the way you refer to it. And maybe you can elaborate on that because let's say everybody out there listening to this wants to create wealth. Well, how do you instead of saying, asking the lousy questions, how do you build a habit and how long does it take to build a habit where you become the servant of many? Tony Robbins, that's a lot of questions. James Al Tucker, yes. I packed it all, we have 15 minutes. Tony Robbins, here's what I'd say. The man who impacted my life. In terms of, I think at a very deep level, is a man. Named Jim Ron. He's a personal development. Speaker. When I was 17, I went to hear him speak. And I listened to him and he said something I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand how my father could work as hard as he did and we had no money and no food on Thanksgiving. It just didn't make sense to me. Like, how was it we're so broke? My dad's a good man, he's a caring man. He's a hard-working man, and so I used to have that anger, you know, all those rich people thing, and I grew up on the other side of the tracks and that whole story. But Jim Ron changed that in me. Cause he's such an elegant man. And he said, you know, he was talking to the audience, and later on I got to know him and he shared with me personally. But he was talking to the audience. He said, you have to understand how the economic ladder works. You're paid for value, not your soul's value, not your spiritual value. That's priceless for any human being. But in the economic world, you're paid for added value, and if you can find to add more value in less time, can a person make 10 times as much money in the same time? 20 times as much money? A hundred times as much money? Yes, if they become more valuable. But most of us, we want things to change, but we don't want to change. We want things to get better, but we don't want to get better. Right, and those two don't go together. And so he said, you know, if you look at it, in those days, I don't remember the number, but I can tell you. Today, McDonald's, right, you make $7.25 an hour. It's $15,000 a year. You can't survive on that. That's total poverty, right? And yet, a guy like Tupper, who last year, you know, underscore management made $3.50, or 6, I think, billion, more than $3 billion in personal income. That's absurd. That's wrong. You know, Ron looked at it very differently. He said, if he was alive today, he would have said to me. Tony, he got in a world where people are getting 25 basis points, when you're giving all of your hard-earned money to a bank and you're getting a quarter percent, a half a percent, maybe one percent. He got people 42 percent return. At one percent, it'll take you 72 years to double your money. At 42 percent. It's a little over two years and you're doubling your money. The difference in what he's doing in terms of people's quality of life, what he could offer them, is mind-boggling, and that's why he's, he's not doing it for one person or two. He's doing it at scale. So I looked around. My mom wanted me to be a truck driver. When I was a kid, I'm old enough, I used to watch these commercials, truck masters, truck driving school, and these ads, these commercials on television, you know, you can make $24,000 a year as a truck driver. And I remember, she really wanted me to do that cause I'd make twice as much as my dad who was a parking attendant in an underground parking lot in Century 
city in LA his entire life for 38 years. So it's like my dad, somebody came in, he looked, punched it. Said the price, took the money. You could teach a lot of people to do that. So when a lot of people can do it, it's not very valuable. It's valuable, but not very valuable. So you could be made saying he should be getting more per hour, but the truth is. What Ron said is the secret to wealth is to become more valuable, to work harder on yourself than on anything else. And in fact, I was on the Today Show with Warren Buffett, the first time I ever met him, and he said, The greatest investment you could ever make is in yourself. He said one of the greatest investments he ever made was not a stock in any company. It was going to a Dale Carnegie class where he learned to speak and communicate. That was the greatest thing because that stock, that investment, doesn't go away. It produces a multiplied result for your whole life. So Ron's thing was work harder on yourself than anybody else. Constantly find a way to add more value. So you look around, and that's what I figured out how to do with my life, but I can show you, for example, a teacher will come to me and say, Tony, I love this. When I first started to put this out, I put out an early version of this book just to see what I needed to refine so I could reach everybody, and I gave it to some school teachers, and this one school teacher said to me, she said, Tony, I love this book. I'm so excited by it, but you know, I'd really never be able to ever earn more in my entire life. It's kinda set by the government and that's how it is. And I said, you know what, you're absolutely right if you stay in that mindset. But I said, I'll introduce you to a guy, and then I ended up putting in the book because of talking to her, who makes, you know, seven million dollars a year and he's a school teacher and he works in a grade school in Korea, but in junior high school, guess what he did. He said I've got 30 students and I love what I do, and he was always finding a way to teach these students how to do more like you. No, here's how you do it faster. Here is a little technique, and he's just obsessed. He didn't just keep teaching the same thing. He was always underscore the students. And so students loved him. So then, some students said why don't you go online and put some more lessons for us? And so he went online and put on lessons and it just grew and grew. And grew and now he's making millions of dollars a year and he still teaches in the class cause he loves to teach the class. He's learned to become a servant of many. The Bible says, if you wish to be great, being great is not a bad thing, according to the Bible, it's in there, learn to be a servant of many. And so he's figured out a way to serve many. Now, you can serve many and make no money too. And a lot of us, I do that a portion of my life, a lot of people do that, and as long as you do it consciously, then you don't want to be upset about it, but you have to know the marketplace will reward disproportionately for certain stills, and today you've got to know what those are. So I have a chapter on how to find what yours is. I mean, there's a young lady when I was on the Today show with Warren, the other person that was on with me was the woman who created Spanx. I don't even know what Spanx are. I guess every woman knows, most men didn't know, but she cut off these little pantyhose and built this. She's the first, the youngest female billionaire in history, and she just had this little idea and she just wouldn't give up and she had no money and she pushed through. So I know those are the exceptions. I'm not an idiot. I know most people, by the way, do not stay fit and strong. 
It's not because they can't. It's because they don't because they surround themselves with people with standards where they point the finger at oh, I just can't do it, it's so bad. McDonald's gives me too bad of food. Everyone's got a reason outside themselves. But if you do, there are very few people that have a passionate relationship ten years later on. Not just love, but passion, but if you do, there are very few people that really maximize their financial opportunities, their business or career opportunities, their investment opportunities, but a few do. I'm obsessed with finding the few who do. Finding out what they do and teaching it to anyone. So other people can learn and compress decades into days instead of saying, my gosh, the system's against me. The system isn't on your side, but you can use the system to your advantage if you're smart and if you educate yourself. But if you don't educate yourself, you just have to complain. James Al Tucker, but, you know, it's interesting. Taking what I called earlier the Tony Robbins method, let's say I was teacher. I would study guys like that teacher in Korea or the guy who started Khan Academy. What are they doing to kind of aggregate with YouTube or videos or whatever and start building wealth that way? So not just studying Dash Tony Robbins, but that's not the only way. That's just one, right? You could be a teacher and you could be doing something else on the side that gives you the income and, look, if you just didn't go to dinner once a week and you had a pizza instead and saved $40, that's basically what somebody spend on a cheap dinner for a couple people. Think about that. 40 bucks sounds like nothing. 40 bucks a week is $2,000 a year. $2,000 a year, 8%. 40 years, $500,000. Now that's not a little money. That's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money that you had to think about. It was just set aside and growing because you used the power of compounding, but most people don't think that way. Most people overestimate what they're gonna do in a year and they underestimate what they can do in several decades. I'm gonna tell you something. You snap your fingers, how old are you? James Al Tucker, 46. Tony Robbins, okay, you're gonna snap your fingers and you're gonna wake up and you're gonna be 60 and you're gonna go what the hell happened, right? It's gonna happen. 10 years from now dash. James Al Tucker, it already happened to me at 46. I used to be 30. Tony Robbins, you were. That's amazing. Me too. But the point is the time is gonna happen. The question is what are you gonna do with it? And now's the time to design it. I wrote this book to say time to master the subject. Make it a game that you can win. Make it a game you can enjoy. It doesn't have to be an obsession. You can literally take what Ray Dalio is talking in here. Guys 85% of the time been successful for 75 years. What are the chances of you figuring out a plan better than that? In the last 40 years, check it out, he's lost money. Four times, and one of those is 0.003%, which means he basically broke even. So he lost money. Three times in 30 years on this formula. In 75 years. He's been right 85% of the time. The biggest. Loss has been 3.95%. Now, if you could go. To Vegas and you're right 85% of the time. Your average loss is 1.65% over 75 years. Gambling. I think you'd probably invest a little money. So he's only one of the people in this book. I give you their exact portfolios. I give you one which actually makes more money per year but it's got more volatility so you have to have more risk.
but a smooth ride like that, he gave that as a gift to people. He didn't have to, and that's what this book is. This book is a gift. It's my gift because I'm not making anything out of it, but it's also the gift of these 50 people that gave you answers they didn't have to give, but you've got to give yourself the gift to go get the damn thing, read it, most importantly apply it. Just a little step at a time, one step at a time, seven steps and you get where you want to go. James Al Tucker, well, Tony, thanks so much for spending the time and sitting down with me. Tony Robbins. Author of Money, Master the Game, 7 Simple Steps to Financial Freedom. It's an excellent book. And again, I really appreciate what you have done. For me personally 13 years ago and also sitting down with me right now for the past hour, so it's really great, thanks so much. Tony Robbins, thanks for taking the time.